Here is Dr. Lori. Wow. Well, I am, I am really thrilled. When I was first asked to speak here, I, I was really excited because I've been hearing about the great work that the Lyme Association has been doing for years, and so it was kind of cool to think about coming. And I kind of imagined us, a bunch of us kind of sitting around a couple tables, and so this is really quite a big group, and, and it's, uh, it's a lovely group, and it's also kind of fun for me to see some of my patients out there. And so, um, so immune function. Um, I graduated from an East Coast medical school, and so I'm obligated to have at least one confusing slide with lots of things on it that are kind of hard to understand, and so this is it, so okay, we're done with that. Um, and what it does is it, it illustrates how complex the immune system is. There are cells that attack antigens, um, there are cells that, um, that create antibodies, uh, the system was created to have lots of backup so that if one system fails, another can help to, um, to repel the invaders that, are, that we think are a danger to us. Um, but the problem is that Lyme is actually a very, very complex illness and way more important to look at immune function with Lyme than, say, a cold or a strep throat. The Borrelia bacteria is very, very smart. It knows how to hide from us. It knows how to seek out the parts of our body that have less immune function. It knows how to, how to hide even within our own cells. It knows how to create biofilms, which are slimy masses of bacteria that are like fallout shelters. And it knows how to change itself so that our immune system is always confused and, and kind of one step behind it. It's like whack-a-mole. As soon as we think that we know how to take care of this infection, it changes its surface proteins and it looks totally different. It also knows how to suppress our immune system. So it's kind of like it knows how to lock our soldiers in the closet. And even worse, it dysregulates our immune system, which is kind of like putting a blindfold on our soldiers so that our soldiers still have guns and they're shooting randomly and harming lots of innocent bystanders, i.e. other parts of our body. So this is basically a tricky bug, and what can we do to fight it? The bottom line is that antibiotics really aren't enough, and if you think that all you need to do is take antibiotics and not recruit your lifestyle, the other parts of your body, the organs of detoxification like your liver and your hormonal systems, I don't think you're as likely to get better. So it's not just about making our immune system stronger, it's also about making it healthier in general. And the good news is that everything we do that makes our immune system healthier is, better, is good for us um, for all other reasons as well. So we're going to talk about lifestyle, the other parts of our body that we need to strengthen, supplements, pharmaceuticals, so prescription drugs, and we're going to talk for dessert about biofilms and biotoxins, which are fascinating things. So a lot of what we need to talk about is lifestyle. So the good news is sometimes with Lyme disease, it kind of feels like you're, you're powerless against this horrible bug. And the good thing is that there's actually a lot that you can do to make yourself healthier and to fight. So we're going to talk about diet, sleep, exercise, alcohol use, smoking, and other toxins. Diet. Who wants to tell me what the best diet is for Lyme disease? Anybody want to yell out? No yeah. sugar, no gluten. No sugar, no gluten, no dairy. No, 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 no. No, no, no. OK. Lots of deprivation. <laughs> Fresh vegetables, okay, what else? Protein, protein, protein. Protein, 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 okay. What kind of protein? Chicken. Chicken, so some, one person says chicken. Organic nuts. Excuse me? Organic nuts. Organic nuts, okay. So one of the things that is frustrating is there are a lot of different opinions about diet. I mean, there are a lot of different opinions about diet in general, um, many of them mutually exclusive. But I think that there's some certitude about certain things that we can all agree on. So for example, I'm going to give you a multiple choice question. Which is better for us, this diet or this diet? So, okay. 
that was, that was an easy one. So one of the things that's, that's difficult too is that there really are different, uh, differences of opinion about diet. And in particular, some of you are going to doctors who believe in the paleo diet. So what's the paleo diet? Anybody know? I guess none of you are going to doctors who do paleo diets, or you're being very shy. Isn't it supposed to be that you eat what cavemen? Eat? Yeah, so it's kind of the caveman diet. So cavemen supposedly, well, they obviously didn't eat at McDonald's, but they also didn't eat a lot of grains. They didn't eat a lot of sugar. Um, so the paleo diet is primarily animal protein um, and vegetables. Um, on the other hand, there are some of you who go to doctors who advocate a low-fat vegan diet. So, you know, they're, they're pretty mutually exclusive in terms of the protein sources, but the thing that they have in common is both of them emphasize fruits and vegetables and real whole foods. Um, so I think that the bottom line is with diet that it's different than the standard American diet. So, most Americans eat a lot of processed food. They eat white bread, they eat white rice, they eat um, lean cuisine, they go to McDonald's, they go to Lian Chin, and they're not eating fresh whole foods. And in particular, they're not eating vegetables. And one of the things that I do every time I have a new patient of, of any kind, not just Lyme disease, is I ask them, you know, what do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? What do you eat for dinner? Um, and I'm astonished that people say things like, yeah, I eat vegetables uh, three times a week. And we should have three of them per meal. So there is, the good news is that if your diet is really bad, there's a lot of room for improvement. And if your diet is really good, well, hey, you got that one step ahead already. So I would say that we can probably all agree that the appropriate Lyme diet is low glycemic, so not a lot of sugar, not a lot of things that turn into sugar easily, alkalinizing. Alkaline diet is a primarily plant diet. Um, most plants create a more alkaline environment and most proteins create an acid environment. Now, it doesn't really make sense because pineapple is acidic, but chicken is not. I mean, it doesn't taste acidy. And the problem is that amino acids, which are the, are the building blocks of protein, create acids in our body. And an acidic environment actually creates more pain. And it also is not good for our immune system. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat protein, and as we'll talk about at the bottom, adequate protein is really important. But a primarily plant diet is really important. Anti-inflammatory. The Mediterranean diet has recently been um, advocated as a way of improving heart health, and it really is primarily an anti-inflammatory diet. So you have, again, lots of vegetables, um, real food, not processed food, um, a moderate amount of animal protein. Low allergen. Somebody said gluten-free, dairy-free, everything yummy-free. Um, and it is true that probably about 20 to 25% of people feel better when they don't eat gluten. Celiac disease affects about one out of 140 Americans, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And there are probably about one out of four or one out of five people who may not have celiac disease, but they really should avoid gluten. How do you know? Well, you go off of gluten and you see if you feel better. You go back on it and you see if you feel worse. So it certainly is an easy thing to do, but the one thing I would tell you is don't substitute a lot of gluten-free crap for the gluteny stuff. Low toxin, organic as much as possible. Um, how many of you know about the environmental working group? Dirty dozens, a uh, few people. So the environmental working group is a, is a fabulous organization. You can just go online and find them. And they have a list of the foods that are the most contaminated with pesticides and a list that are the least contaminated with pesticides. So if you can't afford to eat all organic, you can at least know what are the things that if you're gonna eat them, it really is better to eat organic because those are the things that are gonna have the most contamination. And then adequate protein. So how much is adequate protein? A serving of protein is really kind of the size of a deck of cards or the size of the palm of your hand. Um, you really don't need a steak this big 
to get your protein needs met. Um, but you do want to make sure you're getting some protein and high quality protein because it is true that your immune system really does need protein in order to, uh, to be optimal. So as I said, cut out the crap, cut out sugar. If you're eating sugar, it's like you're pouring gasoline on the fire of yeast overgrowth and you're really asking for trouble. Um, gluten, I mentioned, some people do feel better off of gluten. Nightshades, the nightshade vegetables are potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, okra. And a subset of people do have actually what's called um, nightshade induced arthropathy, which means that it, their joints hurt when they, eat, when they eat the nightshades. And again, the only way to tell is you go off the nightshades, you see if you feel better, you go back on them, and you see if you feel worse. There may be other foods that people react to, and sometimes doing food allergy testing is helpful. Not the IgE food allergy testing. We're not talking about allergies, say, to peanuts or to, to shellfish. It's really a different kind. Um, and there are doctors who do um, test for different kinds of, of foods that you might be reacting to. The most common ones are dairy, egg, corn, soy, and wheat, unfortunately. We already talked about paleo versus forks over knives. Forks over knives, by the way, is a great documentary that advocates a, a plant-based diet, and it's really fun. Um, but in either case, and again, I kind of tell people, Experiment on yourself. See if you feel better cutting out grains entirely. See if you feel better cutting out animal products entirely. Experiment on yourself. See what feels best for you. And then alkaline diet, whatever else you do, primarily plant-based, it's going to be less inflammatory. So sleep. This is actually from, I think it was a CDC website. The functions of, of sleep is to maintain the integrity of the neuroimmune endocrine system, immune. So lots of times people think that being asleep is just kind of like, like shutting down your computer. And it's actually like doing a lot of backup stuff that's happening in your computer that is really critical because if you don't back things up in your computer, your computer is not going to work as well. So if you're not getting sleep, you're not going to heal. And the problem is that some people with Lyme never had good sleep or haven't had good sleep for a long time. Other people slept fine until they got sick. But either way, you're kind of in this terrible, vicious cycle of being sick so you don't sleep, which makes you sicker so you don't sleep. So it's absolutely critical to do whatever you need to do to sleep. So, Sleep hygiene, I love that term, it's so bizarre, who came up with it? So it has nothing to do with taking showers. It means that you need to create an environment around sleep that is really going to promote sleep and encourage sleep. So go to bed at the same time every night. Use your bed only for sleeping. Well, maybe one other thing. <laughs> don't eat in bed, don't watch television in bed, don't read in bed, and don't watch TV or use a computer or exercise too close to bedtime because that kind of energizes you and it's going to make you harder to sleep. Now interestingly, exercising earlier in the day is associated with more restful sleep. The other part of sleep hygiene is if you can't sleep, don't just lie there and fuss. Get up, read a magazine, do the dishes, do something that's not too entertaining until you start feeling drowsy and then go back to bed. If after 15 or 20 minutes you're still not asleep, get back up, do some more dishes. But it is important to try to be in bed for an adequate number of hours too. Um, if you feel like you can only sleep for six hours because you're too busy, don't go on antibiotics because you're not gonna get better. Wait until you can create a lifestyle that is going to allow your body to heal. There are a lot of things you can use for sleep, and a lot of people are a little skittish about the sleep meds, and I certainly agree with going with natural things first. And the cool thing is that there are a lot of things out there that are very effective. Um, if you have a health food store or a food co-op that you like, go there, 
cruise around the shelves of the things for sleep, talk to whoever's in charge of the products, and see what they would recommend. Um, but there are a lot of things that are, that are effective. The one thing that I will say um, about valerian in particular, I'm kind of singling poor valerian out, valerian has the effect on some people of activating them. So if you take valerian and you can't sleep, then just cross that off your list right away. Melatonin tends to be really helpful for getting people to sleep. It's not as effective for keeping you asleep. So if your problem is waking frequently, you may want to look for a sustained release melatonin. Um, prescription sleep meds, I think, can be very effective. Don't be afraid of them. Um, use small amounts. And with all of these things, you can add something to what you're already taking, and if that doesn't work, add something else and add something else. Using smaller amounts of things and using many things, you're less likely to have problems with side effects and daytime somnolence the next day. Exercise, you know, I could probably spend the rest of the time we have together talking about exercise. It's very hard because I think that people tend to come down on one side of the extreme. There are people who are so afraid of overdoing it, of getting into that, uh, into that crash cycle that they become deconditioned because they don't do anything. At the other end of the spectrum, there are people who are just not about to get pushed down by this, this illness and they push themselves and they crash and they're in bed for three days. And then they get up and they do another two hour walk and they crash for three days. So it is really important to find that happy medium where you're not getting deconditioned. You're doing as much as you can, but not doing too much. And one cool trick is if you exercise for five or 10 minutes even, lie down flat for five minutes. This is much better for you than sitting down because you're equilibrating your whole body and you're much less likely to end up with that, that push-crash cycle. Alcohol. Um, you know, there's a joke that an alcoholic is somebody who drinks more than their doctor. Um, but unfortunately, for people with Lyme disease, you probably should not be drinking alcohol at all. For one thing, it converts into simple sugars. We just talked about how sugar is not good for you. Acetaldehyde, which is one of the breakdown products, actually is a toxin, it's a carcinogen, um, and you don't want to put any more strain on your liver than you need to. Um, and there are certain antibiotics like um, metronidazole and tinidazole that you probably shouldn't, that you shouldn't be drinking at all because you can have an adverse reaction. Smoking. If you needed one more reason to quit smoking, if you have Lyme disease, there it is. Nicotine constricts your blood vessels. And what does Lyme like? A low oxygen environment. So if you're smoking, it's gonna make it a lot harder for your body to heal. Um, if you're smoking, there are some doctors who don't wanna treat you, that they require you to quit nicotine products. Um, I've, I've actually had a couple people quit and I probably that was even better for them than treating their Lyme disease. Um, but that really is something that's important. And it's one thing that I know it's hard, but if you possibly can quit smoking or using tobacco products, you really should. Okay, other toxins. Um, there's some that you can avoid. You can avoid some pesticides. You can avoid um, using plastics as much as possible. Everybody knows not to microwave in plastic. Yes, okay. Um, hormones and meat are another thing that if you can possibly afford organic meat, that's better for you. Um, and then heavy metals, um, probably about 5, 10, 15% of people with Lyme disease get better once their heavy metals are taken care of. The problem is we don't know who it is that benefits and the process of identifying heavy metal toxicity and going through chelation can be really tough. Um, and then biotoxins, we're gonna talk about later. I said for dessert. So, in terms of eliminating toxins, like I said, 
try to avoid as much as you can. Um, there are certain construction materials, and not everybody is sensitive to them, but if you tend to really have problems when you're in a place with new carpeting, you probably want to be careful to avoid um, new carpeting or other things like that. Um, there are um, molds that some people are sensitive to. And if you have any black mold in your basement or in your bathroom, that's something that really ideally should be taken care of. Um, saunas are a good way of sweating out toxins. And infrared saunas are particularly good. I have a patient who found one on Amazon for like $200 or something. So they're, they're, they're pretty inexpensive. Um, we mentioned chelation, and that's like a whole nother discussion. And there are some natural chelators that are really good things to, t um, to use as much as you can. The herb cilantro, chlorella, green algae, and bentonite clay. So I said that it's important for our immune system to be in good shape. But it's not just our immune system. If the other parts of our body that support our immune system aren't working, our immune system is going to have a lot more trouble. Um, so gut. 70% of our immune tissue is in the, G the GI tract. You know, If you have swollen glands, that's actually part of the immune tissue that lines your gut from your mouth to your anus. And so if your gallbladder is not working to get things detoxified out of the liver, if you're constipated, you're not getting rid of things, your immune system is not being supported. And probiotics are probably one of the most effective things for helping with constipation, keeping you from having problems from being on antibiotics, and also modulating our immune response. The bacteria in our gut are not just kind of placeholders that are keeping us from getting C. difficile colitis. They actually help our immune system get balanced. And so probiotics are incredibly important for many reasons. If you can only afford one supplement, get probiotics. And somebody came up to me before we started and said, do you have any good hints for yeast infections? And so as long as we're talking about probiotics, I'll just give you a great hint for yeast infections. It's something that women often have problems with. Even if you're doing the gut probiotics, um, it's not unusual to have vaginal yeast infections. So don't use your good probiotics. Go to Walgreens. Get the cheapest lactobacillus acidophilus plain probiotic. And you can use them intravaginally in your vagina one capsule a night for two or three nights in a row, and that will often help. And you can use them as needed, too. OK, the liver. Your liver does a phenomenal job of detoxifying all the stuff that we come across. And not I don't, I don't mean detoxifying just like bad things, even just digesting and breaking down things and, and breaking down our own hormones and all the other things that, that we make. There are two parts to detoxification. Phase one is when we get the thing ready to get um, uh, sent out into our, into our bile and into our gut. Uh, phase two is when, it's, when that is conjugated and is made less um, uh, water soluble, so, I mean, it's made more, more water soluble so that it's not going to um, be reabsorbed. And if you have an imbalance between the phase one and the phase two detoxification, you can end up with a backlog of um, of intermediate products in the phase one. So it is really important to have both the, the supplements that will help you with phase one and the supplements that will help with phase two. And I put all those in your handout so that you don't need to be scribbling them down. Adrenal glands. If your adrenal glands aren't working, in my experience, I think antibiotics are less likely to help. So what are some symptoms of adrenals not working? Um, people that crave sugar people that crash in the afternoon, people who get on thyroid supplements and they actually feel worse rather than better, um, and people that have a lot of the orthostatic symptoms, I think often have adrenal issues. Um, and severe Herxheimer reactions, I think, are more common in adrenal uh, fatigue patients. So there are a lot of things that you can do just in terms of lifestyle to help your adrenal glands. So one of them is going to bed when it's dark and getting up when it gets light.
um, because the natural um, biorhythms of your cortisol are designed for you to sleep at night and be up during the day. It's really important to eat in the morning. Now, a lot of people don't feel like eating in the morning, but it's important to eat and to eat something with protein in it because if you don't, the insulin reaction is going to kick in your adrenals and, and it's not going to be good for them. Um, and then the most important thing probably is where does adrenal fatigue comes from? It comes from our adrenal glands being stressed. Where does that come from? fight or flight. So if you spent a lot of time and energy feeling anxious, feeling distressed, um, you need to turn off the faucet of where that anxiety is coming from. Now, obviously, it's easier said than done. There's things that you have control over. There are things you don't have control over. But learning how to let go of the things you don't and learning how to take care of the things you do is really important. There are some supplements that are particularly helpful for adrenal function, and again, those are in your, um, your handout. Um, now, mind. How many of you have been told this, is, this illness is in your head, you're not really sick, it's a psychiatric illness? One, two, three, a few of you. So, I am not saying if I bring up the fact that your mind has an impact on this, that this is all in your mind. But there is a mind-body connection and you need to think about what it is that being well means. Do you have any concerns about what life is going to be like when you're well? Um, and there are some techniques that can be very helpful for getting people um, to suppress, uh, I'm sorry, not suppress, um, to deal with the stressors that that may be impacting um, your ability to let go and to let your adrenals heal. So the first is getting rid of the idea that we are unworthy of healing and we are unworthy of love. Christian Northrup is an OBGYN who says, if we had a rampant epidemic of self-love, then our healthcare costs would go down dramatically. Now, obviously, I don't think that if you love yourself, that's going to cure your line, but it's going to go a long way to making you feel better and helping you heal. Um, there is another woman, Lisa Rankin, who's also an OBGYN, who talks about actually not having your health be the most important thing about your wellness, but it's actually the stone that is balanced on the top of the cairn. She talks about things like your relationships, your environment, your mental health, your financial security as being the stones that your physical health balances on. And in a way, when your physical health is not good, that's giving you a message that maybe there's something wrong about the rest of your life. Now, obviously, if the rest of your life is great and you're not eating well, you're not exercising, you're not sleeping, you're not going to be well. But I think the point that she's trying to make is that even if you're doing everything else for your physical health, if the rest of your life is not balanced, then your, your physical well-being is not going to be good. I ask patients, are you in a relationship that is nurturing and sustaining? I ask them, do you have support? What do you do to make yourself happy? So these are all things that are very important that have to do with the mind-body connection, and it certainly is not saying that this is all in your head. There are some techniques that are particularly useful for healing your emotions. Emotional freedom technique and EMDR are a couple that are very helpful. Um, grief therapy, um, if there is a history of abuse, I've found that it's often harder for patients to heal. It's almost like the abuse is still in your body on a cellular level, and so working on abuse issues, I think, is absolutely critical. So, finally, we're getting to the supplement part. You know, you came in, you probably thought I was going to tell you what supplements to be on. So, finally, half an hour into this, we're talking about the supplements. Probiotics, my favorite supplement. Sometimes people say, well, I eat yogurt, isn't that enough? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, I had a professor in college that pointed out that 
In order to be palatable, yogurt has to have relatively mild probiotics. And if they made probiotics that were strong enough to withstand the acid in your stomach, the yogurt would taste horrible. So I'm not saying you shouldn't eat yogurt. I'm just saying that in general, you need more than yogurt. If you do want to get some of your probiotics through food, fermented vegetables are probably a lot better source. Um, so if you like sauerkraut, kimchi, um, even things um, like, um, like the pickles that are made from fermentation, like the, the old-fashioned kosher dills are good. Um, but you also need multi-strain probiotic. Don't skimp on this. Go to the health food store, go to the co-op, buy the $40 refrigerated ones. You want a, a huge dose because you're absolutely gonna need it. You are napalming your gut with antibiotics and you've gotta have something to replace those bacteria. And one cool thing that you can use that's not too expensive and is very helpful is Saccharomyces boulardii. So Saccharomyces boulardii is a good yeast. It's like in The Wizard of Oz where they asked Dorothy, are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? So we think of yeast as being bad, but actually Saccharomyces boulardii is a good yeast. It's our friend. And you can actually even get it at a regular pharmacy under the name Floristor. So taking one of those, and you can even take it with your antibiotics because, ha, it's a yeast. It doesn't care. And if you don't take adequate probiotics, you risk antibiotic-associated diarrhea, C. difficile colitis, and it's really not good for you. Okay, this is one of my favorite pictures. These are fermented vegetables, and you can make them yourself. Um, you can go online and just Google fermentation, and there are lots of great resources. So. Multivitamin. I have not seen any double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials about Lyme patients on, pro, on uh, multivitamins and not on multivitamins, but it does kind of make intuitive sense that it's not a bad thing to have as just kind of filling in the, the little blanks of your diet. A high-potency B vitamin will help your adrenal function, will help immune function. If you have a high-potency multivitamin, you may have enough of the B vitamins. You don't need to say, take a separate one. Um, most vitamins, even the, the B supplements, don't have enough biotin. Biotin is a little bit more expensive, and so it's often in even high-potency B vitamins at like 50% of the recommended daily allowance. Biotin is especially useful for hair, skin, and nails. And it's also important for stress and liver support. B12 is another thing. Sometimes people have trouble with the absorption. So it's a good idea to get your doctor to test your B12 level. And if it's not at least 400 or 500, not the 200 or so that is the cutoff for normal, um, if it's not at least 400 or 500, it's not a bad idea to take a supplement. Vitamin C. Um, Vitamin C, remember Linus Pauling, anybody? Linus Pauling who took 19,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day and lived to be in his 90s. So vitamin C is critical for your immune function. Um, it would be pretty hard to overdose on it. There have been cases of people getting 50 grams intravenously and doing fine. Um, I'm not recommending that, but I'm just saying that it would be hard to overdose orally. Um, it does have a laxative effect, and so you can kind of go up to the point where you're having loose stools and then back off a little bit. Vitamin D. My teenage son says, my mom, she thinks everything's caused by Lyme disease and everything's cured by vitamin D. Um, and he is actually, well, the Lyme disease is about 48% right, and the vitamin D, he's probably like 87% right. Um, vitamin D, we think of as something that is helpful for, um, for our bone health. And it is true, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And actually, vitamin D has a tremendous effect on our immune function. There have been a lot of studies looking at low vitamin D correlating with certain kinds of cancer, um, and also um, low vitamin D making people more susceptible to infections. So the best thing to do is to get your vitamin D level checked and to keep it above 50. Um, the cutoff for normal is 30. 50 is probably really where more of your receptors are saturated. Magnesium is a tremendous mineral. It is very helpful for um, 
adrenal function, but it also can be very calming to your nervous system, especially people that have things like leg cramps and like the weird electrical zinging pains and stuff. Magnesium can be very effective. Magnesium also has a laxative effect, so you do have to be careful of how much you take and what forms. There are some forms that are more or less of a laxative effect. Um, and you can also do topical. You can get magnesium creams. And Epsom salt baths are another great way to both nurture yourself, because baths are nice, and also get more magnesium. OK, zinc. Zinc is also critical for immune function. Um, and you don't want to get too much, though. So probably about 50 milligrams maximum. So if you're taking a zinc supplement, check your multivitamin to make sure that there's not more in that. And if you are taking zinc, it is important to balance it with copper. And most multivitamins have copper in them, too. Um, we're starting to get a little bit more esoteric. Alpha lipoic acid is a supplement that can be very helpful for downregulating the nitrous oxide pathway, which is an inflammatory pathway. Um, and it also pr um, improves glutathione production. Glutathione is also involved in the nitrous oxide pathway. Um, and it's also a natural chelating agent. Fish oil, very anti inflammatory, helpful for adrenal function. Glutathione, I already mentioned. And then ginger and turmeric are anti-inflammatory spices, which you can actually just cook with, get into your diet. Um, there are curcumin or turmeric extracts that are anti-inflammatory that people will often feel better with, too. Um, and then we get into the more of the botanical medicines. So Japanese knotweed and stepania. Japanese knotweed or resveratrol is anti-inflammatory. It has an anti-Lyme effect as well. And then the mushroom deriv derivatives, reishi, um, and some of the other Japanese mushrooms um, can be very immune boosting. So OK, so if you add up the cost of all of these, not to mention the number of pills, you're probably um, exceeding your Comcast um, bill every month. And so one of the questions that I get a lot from people is, well, if I have to pick and choose, like, what do I use? And so, of course, I would say probiotic, 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 absolutely critical. Um, and then most of the rest of them are actually not that expensive. Um, and one of the things that you can do is if you do have a question of whether things are helping, if you're on something already, Stop it and see if you feel worse. And if you are thinking about trying it, you know, if you have a friend or, or a neighbor who says you should really be on such and such, try it for a month, see if you feel better. If you don't, stop it and see if you feel worse. Transfer factors are one um, supplement that is a little bit more expensive. But this is actually something that I had as a separate category, because everything else helps boost your immune function or modulate your immune function. Transfer factors are kind of like getting um, like an immune transfusion. Transfer factors are, um, are small compounds that are actually usually derived from colostrum, which is the milk that first comes out when a cow has a, has a calf and it begins lactating, or from egg yolk. And um, you can get a general one, which is kind of like getting intravenous gamma globulin, if you know what that is. Um, and that will just kind of generally help your immune function. And then there are actually brands that are specifically for Lyme disease. OK, um, sometimes people have illnesses that require them to have other immune modulating uh, medications. So people with rheumatoid arthritis, I would never say go off your rheumatoid arthritis drugs because I think you have Lyme disease. You want to see how you do as you're treated for Lyme disease and then withdraw medications if you can. Um, steroids like prednisone are very immune suppressive. And so the reason that I have some of these down here is because Sometimes you can actually get an immune modulating or immune suppression um, from other pharmaceuticals that are not prednisone that will work more in concert with your immune function. OK, biofilms. We get to talk about biofilms. How many of you know about biofilms? Any few? Wow, OK, good. Yeah, so probably more than, than the average audience. So biofilms are like something out of a science fiction movie. What happens is that bacteria adhere to a surface. It can be um, a surface in your body, or it can be something inert. 
they can identify that there are other bacteria around and they send out a message that's basically kind of like saying, hey, you want to make a biofilm? And they recruit other bacteria, actually not just from their own, uh, of their own strain, but other bacteria, probably yeasts and fungi as well. And they start creating proteins that they can hide in. It's a slimy fallout shelter that allows them to be protected from our immune systems and from antibiotics. And so as you see in this cartoon, um, they grow and then they get to a certain size and then they can kind of burst open and allow more bacteria to go someplace else to create another biofilm. So, oops, treatment of biofilms. Um, Somebody said that biofilms are kind of like Facebook for bugs, that they're a way that they can kind of hang out together and, uh, and make mischief and then go off to other places. So, so treatment of biofilms. What you want are enzymes to try to bust up the biofilm proteins. And EDTA is a chelator because a lot of what the biofilm is made of is minerals like calcium and magnesium. Interface Plus, I unfortunately don't get a kickback for mentioning this um, name, but Interface Plus is a product that has the enzymes and the EDTA that helps to bust up the biofilm. The concern with biofilms is if you're on antibiotics and you feel better and you go off of them and you still have biofilms, there's the risk of, of getting sick again. Um, Eva Sapi is somebody who's done great work with biofilms specifically about Lyme disease. And if you haven't been to YouTube and put in Eva Sapi biofilms, it's S-A-P-I, um, she has a fabulous uh, YouTube video on biofilms from, um, from Lyme. And she's actually done studies where she's looked at the herbs Cemento and Banderol which are two herbs that are from the Cowden Protocol um, that actually have some efficacy against biofilms. Okay, biotoxins, even more fun. So remember that weird confusing slide that I showed you at the very beginning? That's gonna look like, like Mickey Mouse compared to what I'm gonna show you in a minute. Biotoxins are produced by living organisms by molds, algae, bacteria, ha, huh, like Lyme, um, and other things, and a subset of the population is unable to detoxify them. They stimulate inflammation, and if your body is unable to remove them, the liver tries to dump them into your gut, but they sneak back in further downstream. And so people that are susceptible may have mold from a house they lived in 20 years ago that keeps on getting recycled. And so the inflammation causes persistent derangement, not just of your immune system, but of your hormones and your neuro neuro neurological set. So here's the really amazing, confusing biotoxin pathway um, picture, which I don't expect you to actually read right now, but it gives you a sense of how complex the effect of biofilms is on your body. And I did put into the, um, into the handout the link. It's www.survivingmold.com, um, where you can actually download this and look at it in more detail. But the bottom line is that if you have biofilms, that may be part of why you're having sleep disturbance, chronic pain, gastrointestinal problems, hormonal derangements, changes in your um, in your cortisol and in your adrenal function. So, so treatment, ideally if we can find the culprit, is it Lyme, is it mold, is it something else, um, through either genetic testing or just through kind of trial and error, um, then we can make you better. Um, the treatment is generally biotoxin chelators. So there are a couple of different things. I mentioned bentonite clay before. There are a bunch of things that kind of grab onto biotoxins and don't let them get recycled and you just excrete them out of your gut. Um, cholestyramine is one of the things that has been used the most for it. Activated charcoal is actually something else that is cheap and you don't need a prescription for. But the idea is that if your symptoms are due 
to the toxins that are just recirculating, if you can pull them out and feel better, then you know that there's a biotoxin involved. So I mentioned the activated charcoal. It probably is the most effective. Um, cholestyramine is what the Surviving Mold website um, recommends most. And then there's something called glucomannan, which probably is helpful for Lyme, not as much for the molds. And that's all I have. Um, there's plenty of time for questions, and I'm sure you guys have lots of them. And if, um, if you have any other questions in particular about um, things on the handout or you think of things later, I can give you my email and you can get a hold of me later. So thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, I have a question on colostrum. Um, for those that are very dairy allergic, I had a couple of colostrum. Yeah, so the question is, are the transfer factors or the, the colostrum okay for people that are allergic to dairy? Um, you'd probably have to ask the research nutritionals people um, or other companies that, that make them. Um, my under, well, actually, I don't know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anything that can absorb biotoxins will also absorb your minerals, your vitamins, your antibiotics, your pain medications. Um, so you do want to be very careful about it. Um, you can probably take the activated charcoal or the cholestyramine or whatever else you use um, about half an hour before eating. If you have a gallbladder in particular, that's supposed to be helpful because what happens is your gallbladder will dump a bunch of bile, which has a lot of the toxins in it, into your gut right around the same time that the, um, that the activated charcoal or the other biotoxin binder is hitting your small intestine. Um, you're not gonna absorb as many of the nutrients from that food, but as long as you're not taking any supplements or medications with it, then that's okay. Yeah, I've got a question about protein. Um, I know they've got whey protein, which I used to take, and vegan protein. Do you take something like that? So the, the question is about the kind of protein, like whey protein yeah, versus... Smoothies and more than smoothies. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, my, my preference is really if you can get it from real food, that's better. But I, I use protein supplements in my smoothie in the morning too. Um, so I think if you're, if you're allergic to dairy, you obviously don't want to use whey protein. Um, but there are a lot of other proteins. There's soy protein, there's pea protein, there's hemp protein. Um, and I don't know that it makes that much of a difference which one you're using. I think you can kind of experiment with the different ones and whichever one kind of seems to give you the most energy or you know, if there's one that seems to bother your stomach more. So yeah. Yeah, well, so the question is about taking calcium and do you need additional or do, do the biofilms suck up the calcium to make the biofilms? Well, or would it, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, yes, biofilms have calcium in them, but your bones have calcium and you need calcium. So um, you can probably get adequate calcium from vegetable sources and certainly from a calcium supplement if you need it. Um, but I've never heard anybody say don't have calcium because of the biofilms. Because, I mean, they have magnesium in them too. You don't take calcium near to antibiotics. Well, there are certain antibiotics like doxycycline that you really shouldn't take calcium near. Yeah. Yeah? I know uh, biofilms breaking down the bad ones is important at least to recovery. Are there such things as good biofilms that can good bacteria we have to worry about? Yeah. Good, good question. So it's kind of like the witches. Are there good biofilms and bad biofilms? And, and you're absolutely right. Actually, um, we probably have biofilms of good bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract that are really important. Um, and there have been studies of, of you know, these supplements that are biofilm 
breaker uppers that say that they don't affect the good biofilms in your gut. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, the bottom line is that um, other than the biofilms in your gut, there probably isn't any place else in your body that you should have biofilms. So, other question? Yeah. Um, after going through like a monthly kind of or herbs that always happens around the same time of the month for me, I just have a knock on my butt for about two weeks with like a, a almost a feeling of being hungover really bad. Mm. Um, and I just I'm trying different things to try to hasten that process because it's really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. stuck. Yeah. So the, the question is that when you have your regular herxing um, and you feel like for a week or two after that you kind of feel toxic and icky and, and what, would, what would be useful to speed up the, the, the herx resolution? Um, and, and would something like activated charcoal be helpful for that? It, it certainly might be. Um, and I, you know, I don't know that that anything that really boosts your immune system would be good because in a way a Herx is kind of your immune system is finally fighting back. So yeah, so something like the activated charcoal, generally what I recommend for people are things like that would be a good time to do more of the saunas, um, Epsom salt baths, taking more magnesium. Those are the things that I can think of that might be helpful. So great. Other questions? Any other questions? I took um, Mandaro and some mental together. Um, I, was, I got towards the end of my treatment. I got to that point where I was just doing errors. And um, I started having problems with my mind. My question is, because I didn't have that before, is it possible that that broke open those biofilms in the brain and let them go? Because I, I kind of stopped and I got scared. Mm. And I was wondering if I jumped the boat a little earlier, <laughs> you know, Hmm. I'm trying to decide what to do next. So, so the question is that you were taking Cemento and Banderol and you had like cognitive, like brain stuff that you hadn't had before? A lot of good things happened. My hands stopped hurting and all this, but then all of a sudden I started having a lot of anxiety and things to do with my mind. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, cemento and banderol, you know, sometimes we think of herbs as being not as effective as antibiotics. And, and sometimes people will herx more on, on herbal therapies than, than they will on, on others. Um, I, I don't think that the brain is a place that you're likely to have a lot of biofilms. Um, biofilms would be more likely places like bladder, joints, you know, so places that um, and a part of the problem with your brain is that there's not as much immune um, fighting back in your brain. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of like a safe house, unfortunately, for the, the Lyme bacteria. So I'm, I'm not sure what to say about your experience, whether that was breaking up biofilms or something else. But, okay. yeah. um, could you say something about the herb teasel? Teasel, okay. Um, Teasel is, is one of the classic herbs that's used for, um, for fighting Lyme. Um, I don't know of many people that have had a lot of luck using it on its own. So it, was there a particular thing you were wondering about it or just? How effective, and you're saying it's used with other things like wine Yeah. Um, well, this is, this is kind of getting into one of those, um, those areas of, of debate. And, there are a lot of naturopaths and, and, and other practitioners who say that we really should primarily use herbs and only if they don't work to move on to antibiotics. And I do think that there's a subset of people with Lyme who will benefit from herbal therapies and don't need to go on to antibiotics. Uh, to be honest, I think it's kind of the exception to the rule, though. Um, 
but it, it certainly is worth trying, and if it doesn't work, then moving on. Um, in terms of, of effectiveness, um, I, like I said, I've never used teasel by itself. If I were going to use just herbal therapies, I think I would probably do more of the Buhner protocol, um, Stephen Buhner, B-U-H-N-E-R. Um, that doesn't, it, teasel is not one of his primary herbs, I don't think. Um, and then the Byron White formulas are, are really quite impressive. There's a, probably a homeopathic component to them. Um, but I've had people have really good luck with that too. Oh, Byron White formulas, yeah. Yep. Is, um, since it is a chronic illness, um, would we consider pulsing various things throughout our lives? So maybe doing herbs for a time and doing antibiotics for a time, going back to herbs and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, pulsing is, is one of those interesting things that, um, that is somewhat controversial too. The, um, pulsing antibiotics probably is falling out of favor to some extent. Um, you know, I know that there's, there's some Lyme practitioners who have advocated that. Um, I, I think that you're more likely to get allergic, or uh, excuse me, not allergic reactions, um, resistance if you do that. Um, in terms of pulsing, herbal formulas, I mean, that certainly is much safer because herbs have so many different compounds in them, bacteria are much less likely to actually get resistant to them. Um, if you're having symptoms, you probably should be on something. And if you're not having symptoms, I don't know that you need to be on it. So it kind of sounds like you're talking about using them just like as a preventive, like, you know, kind of taking your cod liver oil. So like, you know, doing your herbs every couple months or something. Um, I guess I would say that if you're feeling well, you probably don't need them. And if you're not feeling well, then you shouldn't be pulsing. You should be on them until, until you're, you're better. So. Uh, you might want to see this question, but I'm always talking my doctor about believing that she has Lyme disease. There's a doctor she goes to that doesn't believe in her. Oh. Yeah. So the question is, how do you talk to family members who have been told by their doctors that they don't have Lyme? Um, and that's, that's really hard. I mean, I think many of you have probably known neighbors or friends or, or relatives who, boy, if they don't have Lyme, you're going to eat your hat. And yet they don't agree with you. Um, and, and there's not that much you can do sometimes. You know, if it's somebody that you really care about, like, like a family member, like a daughter, um, trying to get them to see things from your perspective through um, the documentary Under Our Skin, um, the book Cure Unknown. If it's something that's a little bit more objective, um, sometimes you can encourage them to get a second opinion from someone. The problem is that much of the time, everything else in the culture is going to be reinforcing the idea that they got at the Mayo Clinic, at their doctors, wherever, that it's not Lyme. Um, and that's, that's a tough one. So there's, there's only so much you can do. At some point, I think you kind of have to just wait for the time to be ripe. And sometimes people's opinions change. Something happens to their health or something, some new piece of information comes out and there, there's that teachable moment or that, that little opening where they're, they're just a little bit more willing to, to look at the, po the possibility that you're right. But that's a tough one. Yes. My heart goes out to that gentleman because of the fact that the greater question is that we're told that there's no such thing as chronic Lyme. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. My first problem with my daughter is she was going to the Lyme doctor. She was off not on antibiotics, so it was the same She started going to the Lyme doctor in your uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I don't know why she went there, but she found out. Like and another doctor up here said, well, you're getting sick from the antibiotics. That's making you worse. You know, there's not the antibiotics in the cell that make you sick. Yeah. But they, I understand where the antibiotics do cause that adverse reaction. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, you know, the fact that if somebody is, is on antibiotics and herxing uh, and, and her doctor said, 
your, the antibiotics are making you sick, and she caved. Sounds like, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, but part of the problem is that if the prevailing paradigm is that there is no such thing as chronic Lyme, um, we're gonna have to convince people one mind at a time. Um, and unfortunately, we live in an area where there's plenty of opportunities to tell people, you sound like you might have Lyme disease. Maybe you should go get that checked out, not from your regular doctor, but from somebody who might know a little bit more about it. But I think the fact that you are all here and are working in your communities and telling people and talking about it at work, um, that's the way that the paradigm is gonna change. It's not gonna change from the top down. It's gonna change from all of us saying, this is ridiculous, we really need to to change the way things are. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you uh, recommend for mycoplasma? What do I recommend for mycoplasma? Um, to be honest, I have not um, treated mycoplasma as much. Um, a lot of the things that treat mycoplasma also treat Lyme. Um, azithromycin, doxycycline, so. And also I was going to ask, um, like regarding the question about how you know, she feels worse, like once a month or whatever, what do you say the growth cycle is for Lyme? You know, like it's got a, it's got like a growth cycle. Yeah, it's, it's better, feel worse. yeah, so you're asking what's the like growth what cycle, yeah. It, it usually, the growth cycle of Lyme is about four to six weeks, and so that's actually one of the classic symptoms that I use to try to identify does somebody have Lyme disease or not is my fibromyalgia flares every four weeks. Um, the other interesting thing, speaking of four weeks, is that many women will find that their symptoms flare around their menstrual cycle. There's clearly some kind of hormonal tie-in, um, which has not been investigated as much as it, as it ideally should be. By the way, Babesia tends to have a cycle that's much shorter, three to seven days. So if people are flaring every three to seven days with their symptoms, that's one of the things that makes me wonder if they have a co-infection with babesiosis. So. Is there a resource you can point us to or information where you can find doctors in our network that actually do treat or believe in Lyme? I'm sorry, doctors in your network who yeah, believe so in Lyme? Um, yeah, the, uh, you guys have a list of people. Yes, talk to us after yeah, you yeah. So, so yeah, Minnesota Lyme Association has a list of of Lyme literate providers. Um, now, you'd still have to kind of track down. You know, are you in my network? Um, not all providers take insurance. Some you can get reimbursed for. So that would be something to to look into too. So, yeah. okay, two more questions. Oh. So you're asking about the combination of Lyme and autoimmune diseases right. and how those are treated. Yeah, that's that's tricky. And I think that a lot of times, especially when people have, you know, autoimmune disease that the rheumatologist can't really put in a box. It's something weird that's autoimmune. That makes me think it's probably due to Lyme disease. Um, but as I said, you know, I, I would never tell somebody, oh, go off your prednisone because you have Lyme disease and you need to be treated. Um, I will start antibiotics on people who are on prednisone. Um, if she can work with her, her rheumatologist or whoever else is, is treating the autoimmune condition um, and see if they can, see if she can get onto something like Plaquenil or um, Embril, which are less immune suppressive, then that allows the immune system to be more functional. But the other thing that happens is often if people are treated, they can start decreasing their steroid doses because they're feeling better. 
um, you know, so their, their sed rate will go down, their markers for inflammation will go down, their, their pain will go down, um, even though they're decreasing their steroids. But it's not something that people should just kind of do on their own. They really kind of need to let their other providers know. So, yeah. Any other questions? One more. Just a quick thing on, you know, biofeedback energy machines and if there's any uh, oxygen therapies that are reasonable to recommend. So, biofeedback energy machines and oxygen therapy. Or I guess biofeedback is technically following the energy machine camera, but yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Oxygen being that line press across the body, if that would be any benefit for boosting the immune system. Is biofeedback the same as biophoton, that thing that they do in Germany? Uh, is that what you're talking about? or? I mean, there's a lot of, I guess, just energy machine, you know, there's a QX, yeah. there's the on demand, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so there's, there's biofeedback, which is kind of a psychology technique where you're kind of learning to control your your autogenic responses, but you're talking more about like Rife machines and Wellness Pro and things like that. Um, you know, an, it, it's an area that it would be great if somebody could do more research on because anecdotally, people say that they really feel a lot better um, using things like Rife Machine, Wellness Pro. Um, Energy medicine is probably the last frontier. I mean, there are a lot of doctors who think that I'm like a total wacko because of just even doing the Lyme stuff. Um, and so I'm a little bit nervous about like even endorsing on camera anything that has, you know, energetics. But I will say that my observations of patients coming to me and saying, I've been using this and it really works is they feel better. Um, the machines are pretty expensive, so what I would tell people is it certainly is not harmful at all. Everything in medicine is weighing benefits and risks. So if the biggest risk is that you have a big chunk of your bank account that's missing, you know, but it's not dangerous for you at all, you know, if you can find somebody who has one of these machines and try it out and see if it works for you, go for it. It's not going to hurt. Um, and if it helps, it's great. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Um, in terms of the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, hyperbaric oxygen is kind of basically putting somebody in, um, in a dive. You increase the pressure and you put them in a high oxygen environment and it forces the oxygen into their, into their tissues. It's used a lot for um, people that have wounds that are not healing. You know, so this is, this is not um, an, an alternative treatment. This is very conventional treatment for specific um, requirements. It is not endorsed for treating Lyme. So for example, you can't go to, I think Hennepin County Medical Center has a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You, I can't give you a prescription to tell you to go there. That's another thing that I wish that there were more data about. Um, I haven't seen studies that have looked at improvement with hyperbaric oxygen. There are a couple of places in the metro area where people can kind of just like go and do it. Um, I have not personally had patients that have done it, so I, I don't even have any anecdotal evidence of whether it works or not, but I know that there are some Lyme providers who feel that it's very helpful. So, sorry, I didn't really answer your question other than to say, I don't know. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for all you do.